prefer. It's not sinful to sit. It's not contrary. It's not church doctrine. Just something, a conviction I have. The unruly tongue, what no human can tame. James chapter 3, verse 1. We'll just read the first two verses. My brethren, do not be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and all, able also to bridle the whole body. Let's go to our Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you for these truths. Lord, you know. Lord, you know about our speech. And it can be a problem. But Lord, if we're walking in the Spirit, controlled by the Spirit, one of the fruits of the Spirit would be we have control of that speech. Lord, work in our hearts. Forgive us for when we have violated this teaching and help us to do better in the future. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. All right. This evening, does the Bible describe for us something we do on a regular basis that is a good barometer of what is going on in our hearts. And from that, we can deduce, in turn, what is a good barometer, what is going on in us spiritually. And James has that answer by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That good barometer is your speech. Now, I don't know about you, I, if... God were to ask me a good barometer, I may have not said that. I may have said something along the lines of your Bible reading, your prayer life, your maybe your witnessing. And again, maybe that's all in the same because you're using your mouth to do a lot of that, if not all that. But God says there is a very real connection between what you say on a regular basis and again, not necessarily what you say in church because we all guard our speech in church. What is your conversation like when nobody from church, no Christian that you're aware of is listening to you? What is going on in your talk? God says that's a good barom barometer for what is going on. And maybe James heard this from his half-brother, Jesus. When Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, I pulled this excerpt out of Matthew chapter 12, and if you go back there, you'll see the context is Jesus is casting out demons. And the Pharisees say, you know how Jesus is doing that, don't you? This is no big spiritual achievement. He's casting out demons by Beelzebub, the chief of demons. And Jesus is like, do you know how crazy that is? Have you even just thought of what you said? And then that's what's preceded this. And he says, hey, listen, either make the tree good and its fruit what? Good. Or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by its what? By its fruit. Okay? So in context, the fruit is not some vegetable or other thing that you produce that you pick off a tree or a a vegetable plant, the produce, folks, for us is, how do I know your tree is good? How do I know your tree is good? By looking at your what? Fruit. And one of the fruit you produce is your speech. All right? If I took a bushel basket of your speech, randomly showed up at some point in time where you're doing a lot of talking and just got a bushel basket of speech and took it to the spiritual farm market, what would it get classified as? Right? We grade fruit and vegetables. Good. Well, I shouldn't even say it because I don't know. The, I just know they do it. All right? When I, there's a pickle farm by my house, and one of the summer jobs was a pickle grader, and there was four different grades. So I know they do this. But the point is, in your speech, where would they put your bushel basket? That's what Jesus is saying. He f finishes it up and he says, listen, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil 
do good things. And what's he talking about? You just called the Son of God a servant of who? The devil. Let me tell you, Pharisees, I know what you've done to the rest of the Jewish people. They think you are holier than Moses. But by the fruit you just produced in that statement, you're the best I can come up with is you're a viper. Okay, that's not a compliment. For out of the abundance of your what? Heart. You know what? That was going on. You just didn't randomly say that, Mr. Pharisee. You were thinking that in your heart and your mind. And that's what came out. You're known by your fruit. And the fruit that comes out of your mouth isn't the only indicator, but it is a good indicator of what exactly is going on in your what? In your heart. That's why James, I'm sure he remembers that, what his, Lord, what his brother said in his Lord, and therefore comes when it comes to being masters in our tongues, he says it this way. My brethren, be not many, what? Teachers, pastors, Sunday school teachers, any other position within the church, elder, where you are teaching people. Why? Because we're going to receive the greater scrutiny. Why? Because a lot of you put a lot of trust in what we say. All right? We teach you, you, you believe we are teaching you the truth and we're teaching you God's word. And you know, because it's so accessible in our country to tune into other religious programs, spiritual programs, not every pastor has their people in mind, the best interests of their people in mind. Therefore, because you have such influence, that I'm going to hold you up to greater and greater scrutiny because I privileged you with the position, with the opportunity, the spiritual gift, to get in front of my sheep. They're not your sheep, pastor. They're my sheep. And I've given you the right and the privilege to talk to my sheep and lead them to green pastures, right? And if you don't do that with your words, you're going to be scrutinized. Now, what he is not saying is this. Please hear me because I'm not so sure every Christian understands it. The pastor is not in an elevated position in God's eyes in the sense that I'm different than you. I'm exactly like you. I've been given the same Holy Spirit that you have been given. Do you remember our detailed study in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where you will find one of the four lists of the spiritual gifts? And the Holy Spirit teaches us that in verse number 7 of chapter 12, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all, for everybody's profit, for mutual profit. So some of you have been given the gift of organization, some the gift of giving, some another gift. I have been given the gift, our pastors have been given the gift to teach people. That doesn't mean we're any better. And remember the analogy Paul uses over and over and over in the spiritual gifts section, the analogy of the body. Which one of your body parts would you like for me to cut off as a non-essential? Or would you like to keep it all? They asked me at the doctor this week, so when do you want your gallbladder out? I said, I really would like to keep it. That's the same thing with the body of Christ. Every part, every person is what? Needed. And you start cutting off things, that body don't work. I don't care if you cut off your toenail. You're not walking the same as when you were walking when you had it. Okay? Every one of us as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is just as needful as the other one. There are some that have been given positions in which we're more prominent, we're more up in front of people's faces and say more words, but God also gives us this warning. I put you here, but please understand, this is serious position, and I'm going to scrutinize you harder than I am the person sitting in the pew because I have given you this privilege of standing in front of my people, and God's been consistent about it. 
You remember the story of the first time they had a church service in the Old Testament? Two priests went in the temple to offer strange what? Fire. And what did God do? Consumed them. You don't do that. You don't do that. And Aaron, don't you be crying. I told you how this works. And it wasn't even, and there's an indication by what he says after that that they probably had been drinking. So God has consistently scrutinized his people. In these, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 3, verse 17, son of man, talking to Ezekiel, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him no warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at your hand. I'm giving you this privilege to hear my word. I'm giving you the privilege of being a prophet in my kingdom. Now listen, you better tell them exactly what I'm saying. I'm going to hold you responsible for that. Okay? So God is just, he's not setting us pastors up and, and elders as something extraordinary. We're just saved people like you who've been given a gift, but we understand our calling and we understand that God's going to scrutinize us more than he is you, and rightfully so, because he's given us the gift to be able to teach and to understand his word, and we're supposed to go turn around and make it a benefit to you. All right, so he keeps moving on. Now, I understand this verse a little differently than when I taught it many years ago here. For many things we offend all, okay? This is a transition. He's been talking about the pastor, right? And a pastor, or elder, or teacher does a lot of what? Talking. So this is how he brings up this, ta this topic of talking. And he starts out this way, kind of a rather vague way. How many different ways can we cause people to stumble? How many ways can't we do it? Be the better question. We can take just about any means, ways, or process, and because of our fallen nature, cause somebody to stumble, can't we? But there's a key way, there's one way that predominant is a predominant way. It's our mouths. And if you can control your mouth regularly, you are a very mature person. That's what he's saying. For many things, we offend who? Everybody. All right? And a pastor, elder, teacher who's talking a lot has a lot of opportunities to do what? Offend. But if he, now if you're offended because God nails something in your life, that's between you and God. That's not the pastor's fault because he said something inappropriately. He said God's words and you got offended. That's between you and God. But if he said something stupid, that's his problem. That's his fault. So if he can get up three times a day on Sunday and once on Wednesday and not offend in his speech, he must be what kind of person? He must be mature. All right? The same as a perfect man and also able, able also to bridle his whole what? His whole body. And he's going to give us two classic examples of something that in comparison, in proportion, is very small to the thing that it controls. Okay? That's what he's going to do here. Because the tongue, now don't stick them out, all right? The tongue, in comparison to the overall mass and amount of your body, is not very much of it. Okay? It's a very small part, but it plays a very big role and whether you're going to sin or not, okay? And so do we have other examples of something very small in proportion to a big object but controls the whole thing? First example, a horse, 
right? How big is a horse? I was off. I was said at least 1,000 pounds. It's not true. The average horse is between 800 and 1,000 pounds. Anybody, everybody seen a bridle? Seen the metal part of that bridle? It's about four to six inches long, isn't it? It's about the size of my thumb. What do you think that weighs? Pound, maybe? Give or take? Maybe a pound, maybe two? You take that bridle, and I remember this clear as day on our first horse, and my dad showed me how to come in from the side and put it in his mouth because he didn't like it. You put it in there, and that little piece of metal weighing about one pound, you can get on that horse. And I remember when we were in the Smoky Mountains, Ben was about a year old. We were on this huge quarter horse. They put Ben in my arm, me on the saddle, and the reins, and we walked up and down the Smoky Mountains. And we came to a cliff. Terry will ver verify this. I'm serious. That horse got here, and that was the cliff. I said a lot of prayers. May have violated my tongue. <laughs> and what did I have to control that thing? Ben in this arm, me on the saddle, this little piece of metal. And when I turned, pulled on that rein, guess what that horse did? It turned. To my praise, it turned. Right? That horse probably weighed 1,000 pounds. And if he wanted to, he could have said, you know what? I'm tired of you. <laughs> Send us off the side of that cliff. That little rain controlled his whole body. That's, that's James' point. This little thing is tiny in comparison to our bodies. But oh, what this thing can do, right? Next example, behold the ship. Have you seen the size of some of these cruise ships? They're like floating cities. You put 5,000 people on a ship. There were 2,000 people in the town I grew up in. We could put two and a half of my town on a boat and have things to do. But if you were to pull that thing up and see what actually makes that thing turn, you would find a rudder. Now, again, it'd be big, but in comparison to the whole entire ship, how big is that rudder? Not. And that captain, if he wants to go there, there, or there, he gives a command to the first mate or whoever else is in charge, turn 20 degrees, 30 degrees, and that individual turns that wheel, and that little, in comparison, thing at the back of that boat turns 5,000 people. How many tons does that thing weigh? Ton after ton after ton, and takes that small thing and turns the whole ship, Right? And they squeeze it into the harbor. They squeeze it into its dock. It's not some big, huge thing doing it. It's some little thing. That's Paul's point. This little thing does big things in comparison to its size. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts of how many things or what kind of things. Now, let's park here for a second. This is mostly taken in a negative connotation, you can boast of great things in a positive connotation. What was used to lead you to salvation? What, if you were witness to, what did that person use? His mouth, her mouth. Johnny Hall, who led a group of us listening at his concert, used his mouth. He praised God with his mouth mouth. He was a superb tenor, and he sang gospel hymns at Mount Pleasant, Michigan in 1987. He used his mouth. How many of you were taught by somebody who used their mouth? Do you, uh, did you teach your children using your mouth? Did you learn your skill by somebody using their mouth? teaching you how to operate this piece of equipment or how to do these books or how to do this, that, fly this plane, do this stuff. Did they use their mouth? You can use it to 
boast of good things in the sense of God giving you that. But in this connotation, it's negative in the sense of we can also use the same mouth to lead other people to Jesus Christ, to teach people the word of God, to help them come to know the most magnificent being in our existence, God Almighty, and at the same time use this little thing and tear people down. Right? Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Have any of you started a little fire that got really out of control? I did. My brother and I and our neighbor, we had five acres of land at my mom and dad's at that time in a woods behind our house. We had a three-acre field next to the main house. We loved to go down there and play football. It was our athletic complex is what it was. That spring, we got the harebrained notion, instead of raking and mowing it, why don't we just burn it down? Terry already knows. It started a little, we struck a match. Little spark, little flame, put it down there. And we said what every kid says, we got this. It got out of control in a heartbeat. They had to call the fire department. All the fire engines came to our house. And it started moving from east to west and went right through the woods. And it only burned out because it ran out of things to burn. And I'll never forget that the rest of my, and my parents don't either. How little thing caused such big trouble. There, that couldn't be a better illustration in my book. How many tragic house fires started with a spark in the electrical system? Looking back at Pastor Corey, we were having some outing. We were down there cooking hamburgers and hot dogs on the grill. And all of a sudden we look and boof. We had a good flame going. That's our mouths. The tongue is a fire. And folks, if we would picture our mouth as a match and everybody we're talking to as dried up leaves or dried up grass or dried up wood that would burn in a heartbeat, that's the picture Paul's trying to pick, paint here. How much would it take to set that on fire? The answer, not much. The tongue is a fire, a world of what? What can that tongue come up with? A world of iniquity. And you know what? Unfortunately, I think all of us would say, Pastor Grover, I've had that whirlwind come out of my mouth. And I know from experience, that's not a pleasant thing. And I have used this thing which praises God and caused some heartache in some people's lives by what I have said. It's a world of iniquity, so is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire from hell, Gehenna. Folks, you, you've been there, right? You've seen the family not talk to each other for 20 years. Have you seen that family? Have you seen the husband and wife who 20 years ago pledged their love and 20 years later can't stand each other? You've seen the kids, mom, dad, sacrifice to raise them, talk trash about their moms and dads. You've been with another Christian who trashes his or her's former church or got up in a meeting and said anything but godliness. Right? We've all, we've all had our stories, right? We have all understand. We may even be in part of one or in the midst of one. 
That's no place to be. It's very uncomfortable. And it all happened with somebody's words. Somebody got worked up. Things didn't go the way they thought they ought to go. They got a little prideful. They got a lot prideful. And they, they wasn't, their heart wasn't controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. They just had to express what was on their carnal mind, and they let it fly. And it might as well have been a flame floor at a leaf convention because it just went boof. Paul says, James says, listen, got to get control of that thing. Got to get control of that thing. It really is a representation of what is going on in your body, in your whole body, including that controlled by the Spirit of God. So, folks, how, are, how is our speech? Okay, what we're not going to do Wednesday or Thursday when we go to the library is getting a shouting match. Nobody going there is going to get in a shouting match. That's not what we're going there, right? We're not going to use this tongue to be a whip. We're going to use this tongue to share the love and the holiness of Jesus Christ. We're not going there to thrash people. God said, leave the judgment up to who? Him. He'll take care of it. We get too emotional. And we're going to use this tongue. We're going to use this tongue to invite ladies to come hear about Jesus Christ or to become part of a church, get back in fellowship with God that way. We're going to use this tongue to teach young people this fall about the Lord Jesus Christ, about at the community picnic, how to come to know him, how to serve him, how to be welcomed by him. We're going to use this tongue to pray for people. We're going to use this tongue to pray that these board members repent. We're going to use this tongue to ask God to be gracious to us, give us a God-fearing person at Ashland City Schools as their superintendent, give Hillsdale City uh, Public Schools a God-fearing person at the helm there, give us a God-fearing principal at that school, help us to be salt and light. That's what we're going to use this tongue for. And we're going to be very cognizant that this thing can go off like a spark and set somebody's world on fire. And so we always need to be controlled by God's Spirit. Let's stand. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you thankful for your Spirit, thankful for every needful part of this body of Christ. I'm thankful for the, those who have the gifts of giving, healing, um, teaching, of management, of organization, and various others. And I'm thankful that you brought teachers into this group and have done that for many years. And Lord, I pray that we would honor our position and that we would, especially those of us who talk much, would be under your control. Forgive us for when we've used this tongue inappropriately. Help us to always use it in the right manner. And Lord, I pray as we endeavor to represent you in our community that you would move in the hearts and lives of these board members at the library and you would change their heart regarding the material that is presented to our young people. Help us, Lord, to be salt and light. And we thank you for what you have done. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.